Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, welcome to uh, today's webinar, part of the series in child rich, rich, uh, child rich communities. And it's great to have um, two other communities sharing uh, snippets of their rich stories around children and families in their communities. And we've got Ginny in uh, Maurihau in Christchurch and Adam and Jane in Waimati. Uh, to start the process, um, and greetings, my name's David Hanna. I'm part of the team at Inspiring Communities. And supporting me here is uh, Zeb, who's doing some technical work, and Lisa Woods uh, also helping uh, guide the process. So a little bit, just first of all, a little technical if people are new to using this webinar. We encourage this to be conversational and as, as uh, much as possible. And if during some of the stories and some of the presentations, you've got a question, uh, if you can type that into the box in the panel where it's got, um, what does it, what's the heading say? It says um, questions. So if you click on that questions, there'll be a text box there. And if you type in your question there, you don't need to push the hand button. We'll see that and then we can potentially feed that question in the conversation to the presenters and all that. So that if there's questions, we'll try and respond to those in a live way through the presentations. Um, and other than that, you know, there might be a little bit of technical coming and going as we pass, but that's all part of uh, community uh, adaptedness in terms of that process. So a little bit about um, this webinar and child rich communities. Uh, Child Rich Communities is a, um, can you just move that text box out of the way? Sorry, Zeb. Sorry, yeah. Um, so it's more about a movement. And it's about um, learning of diverse communities that are working in ways that sort of bring out the best and support children and families within their communities. That's broadly informed by a community-led approach uh, and it's not specifically like a, a service or, or, or a type model. It's more about a way of working and an approach. And uh, there's both rich diversity across all the different communities, and there's probably some common themes as well. And uh, it was the result of uh, some intentional uh, conversations between some com organisations, community organisations, Bernardo's, Plunkett, and UNICEF, uh, wanting to sort of understand and support a lot of the initiatives happening at local level with some support from SCIP and Oranga Tamariki. They've provided us some support for this, uh, this webinar process and some of the local uh, groups that are trying to mine some of the insights from these initiatives. Now, we all uh, who are part of this webinar are aware of, uh, you know, lots of challenges and opportunities in how we raise our children and care for our children and how our children raise our communities. And uh, that's the sort of broad background about um, which child rich communities wants to try and support positive change. And in, in the process, um, we've been informed by some principles of the community led development uh, approach. Uh, these are, I see these more as strands, and I won't go into great detail about these because I think these get illustrated more through the stories that we're going to hear from the people shortly, other than just to mention uh, the whole idea around growing shared local visions, working on the strengths that exist there within the communities that may not always be um, acknowledged. Uh, where possible, bringing in the diversity of groups and people, uh, growing local leadership in a collaborative way, and learning by doing. And then out of the process of the child-rich communities, um, or sorry, this uh, diagram helps sort of illustrate that relationships that exist within a community-led development approach. So there's the whenua, there's the role and the special status and role of tangata whenua reflecting our tiriti relationship. And then there are those multiple groups within communities that are woven through those relationships as a sort of a framework for us to hold uh, to inform this approach. And then when we worked with a whole range of communities, it surfaced these uh, key touchstones, if, 
that were common across the communities, engagement, empowerment, connection, collaboration, relationship focused, responsiveness, and think and work holistically. And it's the latter two, responsiveness and holistically, that we've said uh, we want to sort of give some attention to in this webinar. And noting that, that it's really, these things don't separate out. So I'm sure these presentations will weave all of those points. So I think we, um, we want to move, um, be good now to move into the, um, to the presentations. And I'm going to sort of, uh, this is the stage, um, Ginny, where I sort of hand over to you in uh, Marihau and say we're really keen to hear um, some of your story in your community. And uh, notice that where possible, we'll try and make it conversational. But uh, we look forward, Ginny, so if you can click the button you need to do to change the presenter view, that's going to happen shortly. And then the people on the webinar will, will see your slides. And there we are. Kia ora, Ginny. Kira, well, thank you for this opportunity to share our story. Um, I'm from Neighbourhood Trust, which is a community arm of the Northern Baptist Church here in Christchurch. And our main focus is Marihau Shirley area of Christchurch. Um, the project that I want to share today is Children's Voices Project, and it's a collaborative project between Neighbourhood Trust, Kingdom Resources, Tōraho, and with support from the Tyndall Foundation. It's based at Marihau Primary School, with whom we've built a really trusted relationship. And that's really important to the whole foundation of this project. Just to tell you a little bit about the area. Um, this particular part of town, 10.9% under five years of age, and 21% of those families are solo parents. So it gives you some sort of idea of um, young families, often with um, a lot of um, not a lot of resources around them. This project comes out of the brokenness of the earthquakes <coughs> and it's a time of transition for our community. So the local primary school, Mariho Primary School, actually had a 30% turnover over uh, during one year. Now for a school that size and of the sort that it is, normally that would be around 17.5%, so it's nearly double. So we've got a high transition rising rents, um, a lot of the part-time work disappeared for people, a lot of family breakdown, high divorce, separation rate happening, mental health issues, loads of concerns around children with anxieties. So Julie, we decided, what, to, sorry. Yep. I've just interested you, what triggered the, the, the relationship with the school in the first place? We saw that as um, a, a place just where people are, you know, <laughs> rather than saying you come to us and we'll run a parenting course, um, going to where the people are and they, people with children, they're going to the schools, they're going to the early childhood centres, so we said we're going to go to them rather than expecting them to come to us. Um, and so we talked with the principal of Mariko Primary of St Francis of Susie, which is the other school in the uh, area, and with the local early childhood head teachers, and a lot of similar things came out of their concerns. And then we invited the parents of at those schools and their whanau to come along to an evening. So it was a facilitated conversation to say, what's on top for you? What are your dreams for your family? What are your dreams for your kiddies? What would you like them to experience as part of their childhood? Um, and what they told us, the parents told us, that they would love their children to have a carefree childhood, a time when they didn't have to worry about things, when they could have fun, just being kiddies. When right. we asked the children what they were thinking about, all these, all these real worries came out. They said, we wish that flu jabs were free. I wish that mum earned more money. I wish that doctors were free. Um, I wish that worm tablets were free. There were all these real worries about not having enough money in their household and worries about how mum would be and worried about their health and well-being. And this shocked the parents. They had no idea. <laughs> so it's, it was a real um, real revelation to them. And, this and what about... 
and did yeah. it sh what about the response of that to the school and the people hosting it i mean it shocked the parents what about other people as part of that process i think it shocked everyone actually i felt the same right. <laughs> you know there were a lot right. of tears in the room there were a lot of how can we actually find out what our kiddies are thinking and that was really the trigger um, for the whole project was how can we find out what our children are really thinking because obviously they hadn't shared that with anyone um, right and so that that began a um, Toroho had been doing a photo voice project with their young people. They run an alternative school and having seen that project at Papanui Library, um, we thought that's something we could do with these children. We could, we could get their voice heard by them taking photos of their environment and telling us what they're thinking about it. And so we brought down Kim Boyce Campbell from Kaikoura. She's a professional photographer who's worked with children before doing that project with Tōrahau um, and she came down and spent time with the children and so it was seeing the world through a child's eyes that was the idea of the project all, all up there were 146 photos taken the children took, went out armed with cameras and she taught them how to take photos they took hundreds of photos of their environment, of the things they liked, the things they didn't like. And then that was refined down to themes around, there were several themes that came out, but the two dominant ones were around, they'd love their environment to be more colorful because post-earthquake, we had a lot of rubble, it was liquefaction that had just, it was just this brownie gray, everything was brownie gray, um, a lot of, the more colourful things had been destroyed or, or broken up. So they talked about wanting more colour in their environment and wanting kindness to others. So here's a few of their photos that they took. They took the photos of each other and holding little bubbles, speech bubbles about what they were thinking. Stop Jenny, I'm interested. So one of the was the catalyst for this this initiative the the shock when you had that first conversation and the and the difference between what the parents said and what the children feedback, which was a lot of worries and concerns. So was that was that the catalyst to say, let's create a, a space where we can hear deeper what children are saying? Yes, yes, it definitely was. And and we realised that we that in the whole rebuild around Christchurch, children's voices were missing. Actually, that they hadn't been asked what they wanted, and right. yet. And yet what this showed was that they definitely knew what they wanted. <laughs> and right. other other people who are doing other projects like um, Evan Smith with the Otakaro um, City to the Sea project, he said the same. You know, the children knew what they wanted in the red sign. When you asked them, when you genuinely asked them, they knew what they wanted, but their voices were not being heard. And, and so... I think the, the process of a f visual image and photography... Was it, is it was a helpful sort of technique to, to help? I think, yeah, I, I think it is because it, it's actually quite hard for children to voice that sometimes. But this right. gave a way of showing what they wanted. Yeah, lovely and, photos. You know, they, they are gorgeous, a happy and joyful community. Who wouldn't want that? <laughs> you know, this is the, that acknowledgement. Children live in Fano and they live in communities. And they are definitely concerned about what that community looks like and whether it's a safe space for them, whether they are respected as people, whether other people respect each other. That's, that's really important to them. And this really brought it out. More flowers and gardens, heaps of families hanging around having fun. That's what the kiddies want. And, um, and so as a way of showing our community what those voices were like, um, we had that really difficult job of, of narrowing down from 146 photos down to 13. Unfortunately, Kim Boyce Campbell was able to help with that and the teachers as well and the kiddies themselves. So um, we ended up with those two themes being the, the main ones around the built environment and what they wanted for that and people being kind to each other. Who wouldn't want that? <laughs> and so the contrast between those themes that surfaced 
and the themes in the initial conversation, yes. you know, that how it's evolved. Yes, yes, that, that's true. I mean, some of them would be the same children, but some of them would be different children as well. Um, the ones who did that initial one with the little speech bubbles, they were aged from four through to nine. Um, right. These are probably slightly older kiddies from the um, eight to 12 year olds. So I think right. they're probably looking more big picture, whereas the younger children were looking at what, how things were affecting them personally. Um, yes, I think that's probably the difference. Um, yeah, it, it's, we, we worked with Shirley Library and they were fantastic actually. They just really welcomed us into their space and um, said you can have the windows, <laughs> put up whatever you like. And um, this was a particular technique where it's a bit like the back of the bus where you can, from the inside, the light comes through and you, it doesn't look like there's anything on the windows, but from the outside you can see them as photos. That's quite wow. cool. Um, and, and the public just loved it. They loved seeing these photos of, of our children and what they're thinking. And the library loved it. It was only going to be a project for three months, but it actually stayed up for two years. So this is a project, excuse me, it happened really over four years. Two years of the library having it, and we had some flyers inside that told them who the children were and who had taken the photos. They're excellent photos, and, and the children have taken them of each other. Um, and they took feedback from the public around you know, what, what they thought. Everybody just loved it. Um, and a lot of the kiddies, the older kiddies who used to hang around our libraries causing a little bit of problems sometimes, they actually really liked it too. And so we didn't ha they didn't have any graffiti, they didn't have any of the problems that they normally had over that time. Um, when we so first looked at it, That's what you sort of noticed, you know, reduced graffiti and all that. So it was like, even from doing this process, there was some initial things that started to shift or change or what were noticeable in the local yeah, community? Yeah, I think there was that respect for what the children were saying. And um, that was throughout our community from the young ones right through to adults and older people. And when we first launched it, um, the thing that's, that struck a lot of the teachers was that the children who were normally quite introverted and didn't really say a lot were the very ones who put their hands up to be people speaking at the launch and so this um, young girl who's featured here and her photo is up on the wall there and um, she was a very quiet child who really said nothing much um, but she was the main speaker at the launch and she said that it had taught her that her voice was valuable and that children could actually make a difference and could make change to happen so there's a lot of unintentional consequences as a result of the intentional thing of showing their voice. Um, the children themselves grew and developed in confidence around that their voices were actually valuable. And I think so, that's quite a really good illustration of responsiveness. If you've got that sort of noticing mm -hmm. that sort of uh, development in individual uh, children and young people too, who are normally quiet to actually step up and hold a, a host a public event is a pretty powerful transformation so and it illustrates something about responsiveness happening in the process that's great yeah yeah it was it was, it was beautiful to see and their, their parents too they just said oh i couldn't believe she actually would make a speech in public you know <laughs> it's um it's really cool at the same time as all this was going on there had been a group of parents who wanted to start a community garden at the school and um and the principal basically said, oh, I'll go and see Neighbourhood Trust and they'll they'll help you with that because they needed to do um, a presentation to the board around it um, to make this happen. And they hadn't done that sort of thing before. So we got alongside them and looked at where we could do it, talked to um, a member of the board, or past member of the board who was a landscape architect and um, with the support of Tyndall again, um, just got something started. Now it's, it was, a, Again, one of those unintentional consequences. The parents were really keen, and we thought, well, it'd be nice if the kiddies were. Um, uh, and we, we were really intentional about putting some flowers in, as well as the edible garden side of things. Um, 
but what came out of it was that there was a teacher who was really keen on gardening and um, a little gardening club started with the children and so um, here they are planting a tree we've got some of those heritage fruit trees from council um, as well as planting out the garden and so, so am i right jenny is that the the idea for the gardening group or the community garden was that triggered by the parents that came together as part of the children's voices project is, th is there a link there between well there is and there isn't <laughs> they're, right. they're from the same school and they had seen you know what the kiddies were talking about about more color and things around that um, but they also just were really keen on gardening and just thought well you know, can we do something around this? The kiddies were wanting some flowers, but can we also make it a gar an edible garden and um, look at teaching children about planting food, um, creating things from it and that sort of thing. So it's, it's sort of slightly off to the side, but the two projects actually ended up coming together because when we're talking to the children later around, we had this garden going, and said, what else, you know, what else would bring colour into your world? Um, they started talking about the alleyway going into their school, which had two blank walls that were constantly getting graffitied. And they said, well, could we have a mural on the wall? And we sort of said, well, that's a, a really cool idea. We really like that idea. We haven't got money for one at the moment, but let's explore that a little bit and see what that would look like. Um, so we went back into the community and did engagement down at the shops because that's where the walkway is. It goes through from, um, there's a pedestrian crossing from doctor's surgeries and um, a council flats across to a block of shops and then the alleyway going into the school. Um, so um, three of our staff went down and talked to people down at the shops and just said, so what do you like about your community? What would you like to see more of? And we talked to them a bit about what the kiddies have been saying. Um, and we put up this stick on blackboard and they wrote up the things that they would like to see. So there's some of the responses is that they loved the whole thing of the community working together, community events. They loved the fact that it did feel like a safe, child friendly neighbourhood. Um, the people were friendly, it was family friendly. So a lot of things around that. And, and the principal released children from out of class to come and write on the wall as well. And one of the things they said they wanted to see was the school motto, which is respect, believe, aspire, achieve. Really great words to have up in our community. Um, so it was, it was just a, a really lovely um, time of engaging our community, finding out what they liked, what they wanted to see. And from that, we got this idea of, yeah, it would be really great to do a mural with all these things on it. Um, but where were we going to get the money? <laughs> Common problem, isn't it? Um, how we, we love working with others. And one of the really nice things that happened was that we've got the Child and Youth Friendly Christchurch group here and we're on the steering group for that and they um, had the opportunity of having a little bit of money that they could put towards a mural and they said well this is a great project we'd love to support it let's work together on it um, now that landscape architect who had been on the board of trustees at Marihu Primary he'd worked with Richard Pop Baker who's a muralist mural artist in Christchurch who had done a lot of work with him and so we asked him if he'd come on board with us, and he was delighted to. So he actually has taken a couple of photos of the children planting things in the garden and transformed it into a fantastic mural. Um, so that was the space before the mural, and it was constantly getting graffiti. It was just really a, <laughs> amazing um, how much was on it. Transformed into this beautiful mural that has the motto from the school. Um, it has the mariho plant, which is partly what uh, Sabu is named after, which and it means the fragrance of the unseen woman. So the ho, the ho, is the fragrance, and um, Māori used to rub that plant onto their skin. It's a beautiful perfume. And Where so, do the words come from that are on the mural, Jenny? So, the, so the words are the school motto. So that's right. believe, 
aspire, achieve, respect. And, and aren't they fantastic things to have as a on the wall of a, a little meeting place? It's a hub where people just sort of sit down with their takeaways and have a chat and wait for buses and um, sit waiting to be picked up at home time from school. So it's a great words to have in our community. I mean, that's a beautiful mural, and I can see how that sort of just enhanced that physical space. And I'm not wanting to take away from the, the beauty of that. Uh, often the journey to get there isn't always smooth, and there's, you know, and, and when, we, when we share in forums like this, we tend to gloss over or just ignore some of the, the rough edges and the hard bits. But I think it's quite helpful for listeners as part of this webinar is to get a sense of some of the, the challenges and those uh, aspects of it as well and, and were yeah. there those in this initiative or was it yeah. just a, you know <laughs> when you're working in a community-led way it, there are always fuzzy bits and there's always lumpy bits and when you're working with a school there's lumpy bits too because their key thing is that they're there to educate children and it's something that the principal actually said to me, he said, I really love the way that you respect the fact that that's our prime task, we're there to educate children. But the things that um, we were doing around the edges of that, we added value through that. So, yes, yeah, so working to school, school timetables, originally we were going to do this in um, term two, and we ended up doing it in term four, which meant Part that... Of the so we just interrupt, but part of the lumpiness of, of working in community is sometimes the quality of our audio. So um, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a community uh, initiative, you know, apologies to some of the people. Sometimes there's some background noise there. So not all of that was as clear, but uh, I think that's just a really, um, really good illustration of what you're talking about, Ginny. So I think that was a you know very clever move. So, sorry, but carry on about the, um, the, the yeah. juicy bits or the, the yeah. challenges. So so it is, working in schools, you are working around their timetables and you have to respect what they need to accomplish. Um, and that's that's something that the principal said that he, he liked the way we worked with them because we did respect that, which meant that sometimes things just didn't fit the timeframes we wanted. We would have loved to have had the launch of the project in term three, but we had to do it in term four in the end, which meant that some of the people who were involved in the launch were no longer available. Um, Right. But as a project too, in our collaboration, we had agreed that we could slide in and out. So whereas Tōra Hau did a lot of the work with um, organising things at the school initially, that meant that as um, Neighbourhood Trust needed to take over the launch side of things and negotiate with the library and with the, uh, with the school around that side of things and the installation right. of the photos and all that sort of thing. So we just, just slid in and out. Is Four minutes. I'm just being a really upfront sort of facilitator. There's about four minutes in terms of yeah. our time frame for this, so uh, sorry for interrupting. But yeah, that's fine. Were there any other questions around that? Well, there was a, a question um, around what would be your three top suggestions for being responsive to the community. So the community, as you've said, is quite diverse. There's certain characteristics of the community, but there's often in communities, there's often some parts of the community that are easier to get heard than other parts? And what would be, and from your experience, three ways that really helped get that responsiveness um, to what the diversity of the community? Right, I, I think one of the main things is to go to where they are. So you can't right. expect them to come to you. Like we organized that evening, but it was quite a low turnout. You know, it wasn't a huge number, but then the other thing is, to work with what you've got. <laughs> so there's right. two sides of it. They're, they're probably my top two is go to where the people are and work with what you've got. So start from the people who came, but then go out of your way to intentionally include others. So that's why we went down to the shops because that was a gathering point for people. They came to go on the buses, to go other places. They came to the pharmacy, they came to the dairy. Um, so going down to the shops meant that we were asking people who aren't normally heard. Like one of the um, older men said, oh, you don't want my opinion. He said, I'm just about out of here. <laughs> and we said, yes, we do. We want to know what you think. You're as valuable as anybody else. And the same with the children, going to where the children are. They're at school. You know, you can go as long as you respect that space and um, 
build that trust. So that right. four years, we had one of our our social worker went and stood at the gate for two years before we started this project, just talking to families as they crossed the road to bring their kids into school. And that was such valuable time. She got to know them, they got to know her. Um, it's that trusted relationship. So that's the third thing, having trusted relationships makes if you make a mistake then people know you and they know that it's just a mistake not you know and <laughs> you can up, trust. what yeah. was the time scale that you've been covering on in this process because trust isn't something that just happens you know in a week or just after one meeting no. just generally the time frame for this journey but I, I believe that it's very hard to do something in under three years. And that's right. a problem with funders often. We were very fortunate to have a flexible funder in the Tyndall Foundation. They, they basically said, what's top for the community? We'll go with that. Tell us when it changes. Um, very flexible. They wanted to see good outcomes for the children. We put the children at the centre and that was one of the best things we could have done because I do believe that if children are healthy and well then and you're looking at your community for things that make an environment where children can be healthy and well, it's a community that's health, good for everybody. So good right. for children, good for everyone. So right. putting the children at the centre actually made a lot of things happen that might not have happened otherwise. You know, that colour, bringing colour into our environment, we undervalue that sometimes. But yeah. everybody loved it. You know, the really good feedback from everyone. We've just got one minute, and I've got one more question here that you may have touched on. Is there anything else, uh, Ginny, before we do just about bring it to a close that you want to... Um, have, don't feel you've covered or, or shared with the listeners? Um, I, I just would emphasise the go to where the people are. Um, we've right. got a store organised at our local mall at, at the Palms Mall in Shirley for October because we want to go where the people are. They can't expect them to come to you. Why would they? They haven't got time. <laughs> you know, we're all busy. So go to the people. Go to where they hang out. Right. Oh, look, thank you. And the, the question I've got here, and I think I'll read it, but I think you've um, you've sort of responded it to already. Um, and the question was, was there hesitance from parts of the community when asked or approached? And I think, I mean, the story of the old man uh, yeah. is, was a nice illustration of that. Well, you don't want me. I'm just an old bloke on my way out, you know. Um, but yeah. it sounded like, again, by going there and just having genuine interest, that that actually... Um, facilitated dialogue from the, the range of the community. And it's also yeah. an interesting um, observation that you shared at the end there, where under the theme of like holistic, acting holistically, although the focus was on children or children at the centre you talked about, your reflection is that, that that actually is sort of like a portal to the holisticness of the whole community. So if we're focusing on children and, th and, and they're feeling safe and, and, and supported by the community, then potentially that's, that's got a holistic dimension to it for, for yeah. wider aspects of the community. And I think that's a really nice sort of, if you like, paradox, that sometimes by focusing on the group, if you do that well, potentially that actually is inclusive of a lot wider group. Maybe that's something for, maybe Adam and Jane may want to reflect on in their story from Waimati. But, but we've come to an end of our time for... Um, that uh, experience and story. Ginny, thank you very much for sharing that on your journey in the Morrow Hill community. And it's ongoing, and I'm sure there's other phases and aspects of it. And uh, thank you very much for sharing that. And um, what we're going to do now, I'm going to look to Zeb just to check. I'm going to, um, we're going to do a switch and we're going to sort of keep the focus in Taiwai Panamu in the South Island and just move. Uh, couple hundred K I think south down to Waimate and um, welcome Adam and Jane that are part of the parenting hub there to um, pick up the conversation about some of the initiatives within their community and what's going on now is I think uh, Zeb's just sort of sharing the slides so we've got um, on the screen that the listeners will see the slides there that uh, are the ones generated by the Waimate uh, hub 
and welcome Adam and Jane and, and we look forward to your kororo and if you're okay I'll feed some questions in through it so apologies if I end up interrupting you sometimes there's a bit of a lag with, a lag with the technology so it, 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 um, it may get a bit clunky but uh, welcome. Well, thank you David, um, kia ora koutou, it's um, great to be here and Shinny, um just for some feedback for you, great project, really cool around kids. Um, my background is I used to be a primary school principal, so things around kids are always um, fond to my heart. So anyway, I, I'm Adam Rivett. I um, once was a primary school principal, but now actually I sell real estate, but we won't go there. Hello everyone, I'm and I'm the Community Services Leader for Plunkett. Okay, and this is our so this is our project. It's a bit like on when they say on seven days on a Friday with a yes. So this is my our picture. <laughs> well, this is our project. Um, ours is really about a journey. It started off um, when I was principal of, of Waimaki Primary, um, Waimaki Main School, um, and we um, were concerned at the lack of um, well, what children weren't coming to school with, what they didn't know anymore, and the lack of experiences and things that they'd had prior to coming to school. And um, we were concerned, and it was at the time, I don't know if people remember, but the last government was big on national standards, and there was a lot of pressure on teachers to um, get children up and moving, and the difficulty was that it was a two-edged sword. Children were coming into school with less, but the government was expecting them teachers to get them to a higher place. So we didn't want to just sit there and moan about it. We wanted to be a bit proactive and try and think about what we could do. So we called, um, initially called a big meeting of all as many community groups that we could get that would come. And on the screen there, you can sort of see some of right. the people came. And we sort of had, we started a conversation, I suppose, about, you know, why are children coming into school like this? What is happening in community? What do we need to do? And from there, we um, got a wee working group together and it was decided that we would look to try and support parents in our community because obviously, um, you know, there were some things that we felt we could do that would actually support parents and it was actually, dare I say, in the school's best interest because it meant that later on, obviously we look, we're looking quite holistically here, children would, we believe, come in um, to our school with a higher you know, with, I suppose at a higher level generally, whether that be social, or academic or those sorts of things. So we called that and very luckily um, Plunkett came on board and Plunkett were fantastic and have been so. And they um, led a bit of a scoping exercise of our community. And I'll let Jane say something about that. So, yeah, Plunkett got involved as, as did a lot of other organisations. So we did a scoping exercise with the um, support um, great support from the team at um, the SCIP team. Um, we we did the scoping exercise and there was four goals that, that come out quite clearly that were missing in Waimete. So the first one was antenatal education, starting right at pre-birth level, if we were going to make those differences in, in children's lives. Um, we set up a antenatal um, classes all of our own which um, was quite responsive because what the community was telling us what the parents were telling us it was only one in 12 mothers um, that were actually going to antenatal classes so quite a gap in the service there um, they were not going because it was 45 minutes to travel each way to a two-hour course and those courses at the time were held over six or seven nights so there was multiple reasons financial time poor lots of different reasons um, so we set up our own and we did it over a weekend and um, people were able to access them. The other thing was the... I can um, see, Jane, just on your slides, I see you've got there, and you, you've got achieved as well. So you've sort of been recording what's been attained and achieved and measuring that as you go along and sort of, you know, under your goals. So it's, you know, some quite sort of clear sort of planning and reporting sort of stuff within the communities as seems to be yeah. happening. So the the first stage was to address the four concerns that come out of the research and from there we progressed because our project started in July 2012 so it has been an ongoing process so we've had to keep on continuously listening to the community, to the agencies involved and then, then just adapt to meet the needs. But at the time the four goals were the antenatal classes, the community profile, um, the, the need for a parenting hub, a place to belong 
and that was why we we created or established the parenting hub which we'll go into a wee bit more detail but the fourth goal was to support those families that were needing help um, and at the time we introduced a Plunkett home visiting service which which matched um, Plunkett, uh, sorry, community volunteers um, up with families that, that mentored and supported them for, for an indefinite period of time. So that was how we addressed that issue. So just right. on the of the Parenting Hub, there's a few slides here that, that clearly show um, what we do. Um, that, that's actually the space in the classroom. At, um, there was a spare classroom at Waimati Main School, which we were able to use, which was great to have a place of being. Um, I wonder if you had some good contacts in the local school. Gosh, it yeah. sounds like. <laughs> well, from the school point of view, I mean, schools are in, are in a bit of a unique situation because they're really the last, um, I suppose, contact that government has in each of its communities. You know, I mean, that so, and they usually have some resources around them. You know, there's some taxpayer dollars right. going to the school. So we just right. happened to have a spare classroom and we felt, well, this could really support the community. And I was very lucky that the Board of Trustees was a bit forward thinking and they allowed that to happen. So we got this space and it is literally a disused classroom. We were very lucky that we got some support from um, the local Rotary, which was really good. I think one of the strengths about this project is that we have the ability to draw on a really, really wide range of professionals and community groups and people who have knowledge in lots of different fields. We've got education there, we've got social welfare there, we've got health, we've got all these people with all these skills that are able to help us, you know, in different ways around, you know, the well-being of the people that we're trying to help because, of course, it's all interlinked. You can't take one and not the other, if you know what I mean. And these well, are some of the... That's a good illustration, Adam, of the sort of the holistic, you know, strand of, you know, acting holistically by having those range of perspectives and skill sets that you've got, you know, a, a broad team or network of people that you've mobilised around the hub. And just mm. an observation, it's interesting that in both Juni and Maoriho and yourselves in Waimate, that seeing the whole school as a more than just a purely narrow educational, it's, it's learning, yes, but it's also a community asset and it's also a meeting place and a bumping place for a whole cross section of the community. So I think I mean, it sounds like your both initiatives have really broadened your definition and, and built a really good relationship with key people in the school community, be it the BOT and the principal and that sort of stuff. So common themes, but yes, carry on. And having that space allowed, like having having our base at the school, not only allowed the classroom, but the other resources that come with the school. That mm. slide that you've seen now is the cooking classes that we targeted for people. Um, and the Women's Institute come on board and, and there was a whole thing around that, that it was a community response mm. to to the need to teach some parents the, the skills that some they needed. Some basic cooking. Yeah. So yeah, the um, school, school's kitchen combined with the Country Women's Institute parents organised by the Parenting Hub. So, mm -hmm. you know, it gives you a bit of an idea. I mean, the thing is, yeah, every, it was like each um, organisation has different things it can bring to the oh. table. The school had the physical space it could bring to the right. table. Didn't have any money because I mean, schools are so, you know, struggle quite a lot getting money. Um, but Plunkett was able to support us with a coordinator, the wages for a coordinator. So, you know, we couple those things together and you actually end up with quite a strong resource that you didn't, have, that, that, you know, separately you wouldn't have had. Great. So, yeah, so some of these, so these are some of the things that we do to give you a, a bit of an idea. Look, we, there's healthy food. Can I just I'd throw in the same question now? Because just what you've shared, you know, is, is powerful about bringing together all the strands of a community with all their various skills and assets. And the same question we asked Ginny was, you know, were there some challenges in that process or were there some resistance or were there some like patch protection or, you know, did that, or if there was and how you managed that? Um, yeah, I think there was some, I mean, I can talk to, to the patch protection question in regards to schools because, of course, schools are funded by bums on seats. I mean, the more children you have at the school, the more money the school gets. So... It, you know, and there's not. We weren't the only primary school in the area. There's more than one, and um, you know, a lot of our, you know, the couple of the other schools felt that it was a recruitment drive for, for our school um, to get students rather than a true blue community initiative. And it took probably two, maybe even three years for us to get over that. 
and for them to start feeding into the um, parenting hub as well, and actually to see it as a um, see it not not that it wasn't a, it was never going to be a recruitment drive. It was a, a genuine want and desire to better you know the outcomes for kids in our community, regardless of which school they went to. And you know, one of the issues we had was. We, our local MP did nominate the school for an, um, one of the excellence awards of um, education. The Prime Minister um, does those, every, I think, every year. But the difficulty was, is that was all around a national standards in raising those for our school, whereas that was never the intention of the project. The project was a holistic project for our community. And the thing is, some of those kids may never, that we're trying to help or support may never even attend a school in our community. No, the, with the transient. Um, nature of the Waimati Rural District. It, it, um, we tried to follow families on their journey, but it, you know, we were doing work with families, and then they'd move on to a different school. But knowing we had made a difference, brought everybody together, and that was always our focus. Um, even the robust conversations. Going back to your question, having health, education, social services, and of course the very important parent voice sitting around a table led to very robust conversations in those early days and we all had our organisational agenda um, but we also had the um, thoughts to how we were actually going to better the community and that come by listening to the community and, and that's how we worked, that was our model right from the start. So it sounds like, I mean it did take time, uh, Adam you talked about you know a number of years to build the relationships and trust between the, the different schools I um, mean, in that uh, beginning there, Jane, you were talking about having those conversations and yes, every agency's got the agenda, but obviously you were able to get beyond that and, and, and create that. And I think that's really important to note because there's a risk in these sorts of case studies. We sort of present them all as glossy and it's all, you know, all, you know, humming along and all that. When in reality, there's actually this dynamic beneath the surface is real and how we, how we handle those is a real test of actually whether we can actually move on the next phase. So thank you for, um, for you know, for reflecting on those. And I see you're going through the slides there. So do you want to say a bit more about all the diversity? There's core um, activities that we provide as a stakeholders group. Um, there's the cooking, the, the water confidence, um, because they were things that parents had told us that was important to them. Um, there was reading, um, and Adam will talk to you about that, but there was lots of other core things that we as a group wanted to offer. But over and above that, the classroom space was always available to other agencies. So a good example was the reading together, the slide that's just been on the screen. Um, yeah, so that's an I mean, initiative. Um, I mean, it's not our initiative. We didn't write it, but it's a program that we deliver um, basically to help parents now, know, know how to read with their kids and it's, it's that whole thing about if we you know, educate and support the parents then the outcome for the kids will be better. If we concentrate on them then um, things will be better for the kids. So that was something that we've done and we've sort of taken it to the sort of next level where you know we started delivering it um, generally to just to parents and actually we, I run a course now or the, through the parenting hub for blokes. We call it um, books, blokes and beer and we go to the local pub and Books, we act, and beer. Yeah, and yeah, we right. actually we we work with dads um, to um, basically know what to do when it comes to reading and to be part. And part of that conversation we have with dads at that point is things that dads want to talk about. You know, blokes talk to blokes about different things, and um, you know, but it's all got an educational parent focus on it. So that's been quite. Um, quite good and the community, the library has supported us with that and the local Rotary has supported us with that. So everything we do has a real community focus. We know, I suppose, the group that sits around or the stakeholders group that sits around the parenting hub and all the things we do have got lots of fingers and lots of different pies and knows where to go for support or who could help with that or that sort of thing. So that brings together the whole community, I would I, probably would, yeah, would say. Well, just flicking through the slides, we're getting a good sense of the sort of activity and the range of activities that are being uh, facil or hosted or facilitated either by yourselves or by a range of groups. So, um, you know, it gives us a good good visual sense of uh, what's happening there. The, the question springs to mind, and it may be one um, reflect on the experience of um, Māori Hau, in terms of children's voice or children informing 
some of the things that happen and develop there. Any thoughts of that in Waimati? Um, I suppose really, uh, we sort of, um, in the in the early days when the project was about to step, we did actually, the teachers at the school, we talked to the kids about some of the things that were happening at home. That was one of the things that we did because we were so concerned. And from that, that led into the, into the, the parenting hub. I mean, to be honest, from there on in, we really sort of, I mean, to be honest, I haven't really spoken to the children. We, we, we tend to take our direction from the community, um, community groups, people coming in, suggestions. Um, we listen to the early childhood centres and the schools about what they're noticing with the kids or not noticing with the kids. One of the original ideas was that the midwife service around South Canterbury would be um, a bit like um, an alarm bell for us or a warning that actually there were some children coming into this world from families who really needed some support and that we could get some support in around them. So um, that was probably really where we where we take our direction from um, is what I suppose really what the professionals but also the community groups in our organisation or sorry in our community are telling us are needed. We haven't really gone down the children are telling us this stuff it's really what what what's being noticed by professionals and community groups in the organ in, in our community and that's fine i'm aware that you focused on parenting as your sort of key focus and that's you know really and, and potentially what you've been getting back is feedback from the parents about the changes they're noticing in their relationships with their children whether it's because they're reading with their children or any of the other activities that you've you know the rich range of activities you've flicked through in the slides that it's what the parents are noticing in changes in their children, which is, I guess, a really important and equally valid feedback. Mm. And, and we're focusing specifically on under fives as well. Yeah, um, I mean, that was always our focus. And that ties in with all the, you know, the brain development stuff around children and that, that type of thing. Right. right. So I see that you had a slide up about responsiveness and I, there's some, you know, key um, that being one of the themes that obviously woven through it, is there some specific? Well, I think all the way through we've had to be responsive um, to the needs because we, we are there to respond to a community need um, and how that has journeyed with us over the years. Um, having the parent representative voice on our stakeholder group, for instance, has been a good inroad into that. But there's enough organisations through those health social services and education sectors represented on our stakeholder group um, that meet monthly to, to, to have a good lens on what's happening in the community and that's how we progress our um, forward. Right. Yeah. So it's about listening, it's about be, having the, um, the time um, responding in a timely way as, as to what is needed out there in the community because sometimes um, working groups and things take a long time but one thing that we're really proud of is that we have actually got the ability through either modern technology or through um, communication um, to actually respond quite quickly compared to a lot of other projects and keep listening right. yeah right look just a signal there's about three minutes left okay. in this sort of time slot so if there's any key points you want to um share with us there's there's the window well i mean i just had the last thing um was my part of the presentation was going to be around the holisticness of it all and i think we've sort of touched on a lot of the you know we're holistic in the fact that we're an organization that has lots of different um uh, input from lots of different places so therefore we can we can look at the whole the whole person but i think one of the other but the other most important thing about being holistic is that, I mean, at the end of the day, we would like a strong community. We won't get that unless we've got strong families. Children need to be well in those families. So what we need to concentrate on, is what we felt we need to concentrate on, is actually on the parents. Because if the parents are supported and are doing well, then the children do well. If the children and the parents do well, we have strong families. If we have strong family, we have a strong community. You can't have a strong community if you don't have strong, well families. And it starts with the parents and the children, especially the parents, because if the parents, if no, we don't support the parents, they can't support the kids. And we don't get those strong family units, which don't make up a strong community. So 
that to me um, is probably the the one point about being holistic that I think it's, it's worth make, making is that you can't have a strong community unless you have strong family units because a strong community is a collection of strong family units. So yeah, that's probably one of the, the point that I'd like to make anyway towards the end. Well, I, th I think that's a you know a really clear and powerful sort of you like almost theory of change or, or, or framework that has guided your work over the years and why Matty is and and why and what's shaped how you do what you do and why you do it. I, I wonder there just sort of linked to the um, just if we've got a, a, a one minute left or that. Um, you know, you talk about some people with the itinerant and you know come from more financially struggling situations. Any comment about how or what you've needed to do to keep that part of the community engaged that is quite um, transient or has some other specific challenges or any thoughts about how you've responded to that part of the parent population? To the, to the transient ones. I mean, we've had, um, I mean, we have, it's very, I think it's all about relationships and we've had difficulty, um, it's been difficult to try and engage um, some of our young, We've been working with some younger parents, some teenage parents who um, they are also young parents and need their skills set, you know, enhanced. Um, and they've been very difficult to get along to things. Even though we've provided things for free and we provide childcare, we yeah. try and take away all the barriers we possibly can for them to attend. It has taken, in some cases, lots and lots of one-on-one -on -one contact via text messaging or visits for um, them to feel confident enough to want to come to the cooking or to want to come to the swimming or to want to come to the reading. Um, and you have to treat them in a very non-judgmental, you know, supportive way. Um, and that's been a real challenge for us. And I think yeah. having that um, collective approach, like Plunkett have been telling them about the parenting hub, you know, the social worker in schools is telling them, right across all the agencies we're promoting those activities so we're getting a better buy-in because sometimes you know you have to um, nurture them to get there in the first place and I think the more that they hear about the parenting hub as a normal place to go that that is going to be a good place for them to go is, is the right thing to do. You know and when we do those things we don't want them to feel that it's for all parents mm. because parenting is important across the board so you know we're not we don't see ourselves as somewhere you go if you're a bad parent and you need to upskill yourself. That's not the idea. Is that we provide this for all parents and we can all improve our parenting practices um, with a bit of support. So I mean, that's probably got a few people along as well. Absolutely. And that's a really important. I think that's a really important insight we pick up across the child-rich community places and community-led development. Is that this whole thing about targeting and the risk of that word targeting and the whole deficit language and then that whole, you use the word judgment and all that comes into play and that, um, you know, can undermine the holistic thing that we're talking about. This is the community and in the community there are a range of people, different life experiences and you've even gone further in your slide on the screen there that, you know, puts the focus around the role of parenting and children as the foundation blocks within the community and I think um, and also I appreciate you sharing what your learning edge is with those young parents and all that. So we've always got a learning edge where we're trying to reflect and develop our practice and models and, and work out ways of actually broadening and growing that and as you say, like normalising and that, that, uh, the hub and the role of that in the community. Look, we've um, come to the end of our time. Um, so thank you really, um, Adam and Jane, for sharing a snippet of a of what's been a since 12 I'm doing the maths that's about a six year um, journey in Waimati it's a really rich journey with lots of insights and in that uh, across that period of time and um, so I'm really appreciative of um, the three of you for being part of today's webinar and just what I want to do is just to remind the participants in there on the screen that we've got uh, the next webinar on the 28th of September and uh, that will follow a similar format. We'll have another two communities to dig into and look at um, uh, aspects of working at a community-led development way with children and parents and the, the diversity of communities. 
these, uh, this webinar, um, everybody who's registered for this webinar will be sent an email with the link to this uh, on the, to, to see it on the website. And you can forward that on to anyone else who you think may be interested in um, having a view. So it becomes a resource that can be used. So um, with that, I think I'll bring it to a close. We've reached the time. Thank you for all the listeners out there who are on the sitting in front of your computer and listening to that and for your questions. And thank you especially to Ginny, Adam and Jane for your time this morning. Ka kite anō. Ka kite.